Astrophotography is by nature and must be an endeavor in patience, but it's also one in which patience literally visibly pays off. I remember in my early days of astrophotography, I was so eager to image as much of the sky as possible that I would pick three and four targets for a single night. Generally, when I started off, I would choose brighter targets, such as star clusters and galaxies, and that worked well. But when I turned my attention to nebulae, that often did not work as well as I had hoped. And I soon began to think of astrophotography as an investment, or rather, that every night spent under the stars with a telescope pointed at the same target was a contribution to information. And each night with a telescope gathering photons revealed more detail of a DSO. And in the case of astrophotography, that investment is pretty reliable. In fact, all the images that you've seen till now were each shot over multiple nights. At my latitude, fewer nights in the winter months are required because winter nights are very long and in the very heart of winter, I can get well over 12 hours of integration time in a single night. But during the summer, astrophotography takes a lot more patience, especially when a good night will only give about four and a half hours between nautical dusk and nautical dawn. So it takes a lot more patience to do good astrophotography during those short nights, but it's still worth it. And to show why, I thought I would share with you my most recent summer project, the Tulip Nebula. This is a project I have been working on for 30 days now. And overall, it's been a pretty good 30 days. I have so far gotten five good nights and two partially good nights. But given that I started this project in the very heart of summer, when I will only get about four and a half hours of good darkness during the night, the project has so far only accrued almost 25 hours of integration time. In truth, I have acquired more integration time, about 32 hours, but I call my subs pretty aggressively. Making good images requires using only the best subs. So depending on seeing conditions, moonlights and clouds and other factors, I will typically call between 20 and 35% of my subs. On average, it's closer to 20. The project is LBN168, otherwise known as the Tulip Nebula. As astronomical objects go, LBN168 is fairly close to Earth at just 6,000 light years, though some resources note it as far away as 8,000 light years, and it's roughly 70 light years across. One of the most interesting things about the Tulip Nebula does not exactly have to do with the nebula itself, but nearby is a microquasar designated Cygnus X-1. In the image visible in Nina here, it would be off the frame, just a little off to the lower right. The hardware used to film this entire sequence was the Celestron 203mm or 8-inch Schmidt-Cassegrain telescope, ZWO LRGB filters, a Player One Ares M camera, and the whole rig was mounted on a Skywatcher EQ6R mount. All subframe exposure times were 60 seconds, and the camera was set to 5 points over unity gain, or 130. Despite being described as a moderately bright nebulous structure, the Tulip Nebula is remarkably dim. A 60-second sub has just become visible in the imaging region of Nina. And as you can see, it's barely visible at all. In fact, when I shot the very first subframe, I did wonder for a moment if I was actually on target. If we look at that 60-second sub in full frame here, you can just barely see the brightest region of the crescent, arcing below and to the left of the two bright stars in the lower left center of the image. However, very dim nebulous structure fills this entire region of space, but it's going to take a great deal of imaging time for it to become visible. This is the result of the first night of attempting to image this nebula. It was not a great night for a number of reasons. There were only about four and a half hours between nautical dusk and nautical dawn. There was a nearly full moon during part of that night. And on top of that, there were intermittent clouds and periods where the seeing went from pretty good to really atrocious. So I had to make do with 169 minutes of good subs and call the rest, called a lot of the rest. I'm pretty good with signal cultivation techniques. Those are digital photo developing techniques designed to amplify a parent's signal. But even then, this is as much of the image as I could bring out. I should note that I'm using a reducer corrector with the SCT telescope. So its focal length is 1240 millimeters and its F ratio is 6.3. So it's not super dim. There just is not a lot of information there to work with. The second night that came up was a better quality night in many ways. The seeing was much better and there were no clouds at all to deal with. However, there was a full moon up through much of that night. Now generally, I'm willing to shoot even nebulae with LRGB, as long as the nebulae are more or less on the opposite side of the sky and the Tulip Nebula was. So I went ahead and shot it that night and I just made it a point to shoot with my blue and green filters long before the moon came up and then shot with a luminance filter while the moon was low. 
I shot through the red filter when the moon was at its worst. The moon creates what is tantamount to light pollution, at least for us astrophotographers, but it's also a broadband emitter, meaning its light pollution is different from what one would encounter in cities. In fact, it's a light pollution that's much more similar to sunlight. So, since our atmosphere is very good at diffracting blue light, you want to get any blue signal that you need to shoot before the moon comes up. Since there is a lot of blue in the green channel, you want to also get your green either before the moon comes up or when it's still very low on the horizon. The luminance channel will carry signal from what we perceive as red, blue, and green colors. So you want to film as much of the luminance channel as you can while the moon is also low on the horizon, or ideally below the horizon. But I find the L channel can tolerate some moonlight much better than the blue and green filters. So it's the third priority on a night that I am competing against the full moon. And I'll shoot on the L channel till the moon is about 20 degrees on the east or west horizon. Once the moon is over 20 degrees, it's time to catch the red signal. It's not that the red signal is immune to moonlight, but it is the one that seems to be interfered with the least by the moon. But once the moon is very high in the sky, I'll shoot something else. I'm not going to bother with the moon. In fact, on this night, once the moon moved over about 30 degrees over the horizon and started to move toward the center of the sky, I decided just for the heck of it to do a luminance-only shot of the Whirlpool Galaxy. I had been wanting to see how much detail I could pull in with just two or three hours of integration through the SCT, and I was pretty impressed. SCTs are good telescopes, and they've always been my favorite design, and this is why. So back to the task at hand. Night 3 rolled along, and I was able to get 225 more minutes of integration for a total of 641 minutes. The moon was waning, but there was still about an 84-85% full moon that night, and by and large I shot around it using the same strategy that I described a moment ago. More detail is beginning to resolve in the image, especially in the brighter regions, though the color in the two central stars in the blue region of the nebula is overcooked due to having to force the data to show up as much as it did. Likewise, the stardust lanes that extend into the nebula like pistols in a tulip are over soft and I had to force their contrast to really make them show up much at all, so they're also over blackened. But new details are beginning to emerge, such as dim nebula structures over on the right side of the nebula and a bit of the nebulous dust in the upper left. Now, in a well-exposed image of the tulip nebula, the tulip actually appears to have a stem extending out of it, but there just is not enough information at this point and all we can see is a region of vast black cloud. Between night 3 and night 4, over a week passed, as Maritime Canada, much of which sticks out into the ocean like an island, experienced a period of prolonged clouds and rain. When the weather passed, nights were about 20 minutes longer, which might not seem like much, but when the nights are only giving you four and a half hours of suitable dark to do astrophotography, 20 minutes feels like a lot. And the moon was well into waning, and the weather conditions were very nice, and I was able to get 249 quality minutes on the Tulip Nebula after calling. This 249 minutes made a huge difference, as you can see. We now have improved resolution of the very faint nebula structures off to the right of the nebula. The quality of the coloration of the nebula is improved, especially in the blues in the center of the nebula. The nebula's pillars, like pistols within the Tulip Nebula, while not yet well refined, are beginning to show more detail. We are beginning to see an extension of the hydrogen gases to the lower right of the nebula, and, most notably, and for the first time, we are beginning to be able to make out the very dark stem upon which the Tulip Nebula sits like a blossom concealed within the dark stardust region below it. At this point, the value of patience in shooting astrophotography should be becoming very obvious. Fundamentally, the longer we shoot, the better the image becomes. Now, I'm still using signal cultivation techniques in all the versions of the images. It's such a dim nebula that it's really necessary. But it's not difficult to tell forced cultivation. Even when done very well, it has a way of looking over-processed, shall we say? A little over-gritty in some places, over-softened in others, as tools such as sharpening here and Gaussian blur there are required to try to compensate for those areas that are as yet underexposed. But the more signal that is acquired, the less such techniques are required, yielding improvements in the image that are easily and overall recognizable. On night 5, there was essentially no moon present, and I had been anticipating gathering about 300 minutes of good quality integration time. However, that was not to be because EQ Mod, which had always been a royal pain in the rear, decided to have a psychotic break, and for reasons known only to EQ Mod, would not update to the current time, nor even recognize where it was in the world, and insisted on pointing the telescope. I don't know where it was trying to point the telescope. I reset all the settings and did a pile of other things to it and wasted a good hour of integration time trying to fix it 
and then I decided that is the end with, of this. I've been trying to make EQ Mod work for ages for reasons I'm not exactly sure of. And it was just time to switch to something more modern and more secure. So I switched to the Green Swamp server and gave myself about a 10 minute crash course in how to use it. And it didn't take much because Green Swamp server worked perfectly, worked beautifully. I installed it, took a moment, and I mean like a minute to configure it, and then it just worked. It worked beautifully and offered things that EQMod never did, such as multiple park points and a home point. It read the time and coordinates from the computer and the planetarium perfectly. It just worked. Man, I wish I'd switched to it ages ago. But that's astrophotography, isn't it? There's always going to be something. And it's why I always say that I don't trust automation. I appreciate it, but I double check it constantly because in my experience, Murphy's Law is a faithful but unwanted friend. So anyway, that night I was able to get 212 minutes of good integration time, making for a total of 1102 minutes. And on this night, you can really begin to see the differences taking hold. I pushed the contrast of this image a little harder, so we've kind of lost the detail of the stardust stem that attaches to the base of the tulip blossom. But we're also beginning to clearly see more of the nebulosity extending out behind the tulip, up to the upper left of the tulip, and the streak of cloud structure to the right center of the image. The tulip nebula itself in the brightest regions is beginning to show good detail, and the stardust lanes that I call the pistols are beginning to resolve out, as well as what appears to be a bow shock region of condensed gases right dead center in the blue region of the nebula. And this night, despite the technical problems that preceded it, turned out to be a turning point in the image. This was where detail hidden in the deep recesses of the information finally begins to come out, as I have accumulated enough integration time to begin to make it show. And on night six, this becomes even more evident as we appear to have crossed over a certain critical mass of information. Fine structures within the pistols are able to be defined. The stem, while still broken up due to lack of information, is clearly becoming visible. And very dark cloud structures surrounding the entire tulip are also becoming clearly visible. Just as importantly, fine definition of light and shadow is becoming visible in the right petal of the tulip and also in the dark areas further to the right and in the blue gaseous regions of the tulip in the form of striations and wisps. Nonetheless, the image still has some weaknesses, mainly in that I'm having to force the contrast between light and shadow a little bit, especially to bring out those darker regions around the stem and the subtle shadowing in the lower right of the nebulosity. And while this image has gotten about 200 likes on large astrophotography groups, such as the group called Astrophotography on Facebook, it still looks to me to be a little overprocessed and in need of more information. And on night seven, just two nights ago from the recording of this video, I was able to get that additional information. It wasn't a great night. The seeing was okay, but it was also pretty cloudy. So I lost about three quarters of the night's information after calling. And that left only an hour and 12 minutes, 60 minutes on the Luminance channel, 20 minutes on red, 20 minutes on green, and 12 minutes on blue. But as you can see, we appear to have hit, shall we call it a second critical mass for development. The addition of this relatively small amount of information allowed for much greater development of all the coloration and structures within the total image. I've had to do very little to cultivate the signal within this image and it shows. We can once again see the appearance of the stem below the tulip blossom, and I haven't had to force that to show up at all. And we can now easily discern fine detail within the pistols, as well as the dark stardust drifting around them. Fine definition of lights and shadow is visible within the lower right region of the tulip. And fine structure, turns, curves, and striations within the blue regions are also visible. All around the Tulip Nebula, much of the cloudy structure that was just hidden in dimness is beginning to show through. And in fact, we are beginning to see that the Tulip Nebula looks to be something like a circle. This may well just be an illusion of the nebula structure, but the more I image this target, the more it appears that way. I'm pretty happy with the image and the information where it is, yet I still do not consider it to be fully done. To me, an image is like cooking. It's done when it's done. It's done when it looks appropriate and proper. I'd like to see the gas structures take on a more solid appearance and less of the pebbling, especially on the right side of the region where things are especially dim. Pebbling is always a sign that there is not enough information in the image, regardless of whatever classic noise may show through the image. As the information goes up, pebbling resolves and noise vanishes. I guess one final thing to take note of is that for myself when shooting images, I don't worry much about the histogram. Notice that here in Nina, the light curve is all the way to the left. In fact, the left side of the light curve is not even on the histogram. 
In terms of classical photography, we'd want to get the entire light curve on the histogram. But in astrophotography, that is much less of an issue. And while I'm certain that some persons would vociferously disagree, I really don't worry much about the histogram when shooting DSOs. My strategy is to shoot lots of short exposures. And in stacking, the light captured in each image will simply be added and added and added to the final image. Ultimately, it all adds up in integration, so that once stacked, 61 minute subs are tantamount to what you get out of a single 60 minute sub. Shooting very short subs might produce a histogram that is heavily weighted to the left, and one in which the light curve does not even appear fully on the histogram, as you can see here. But in the end, it's almost immaterial, and there are plenty of good reasons for shooting shorter subs. The process of stacking, especially when you combine dithering, gives very good noise management. Now I understand that this may not be the case in regions of light pollution where you'll get more shot noise. However, I couldn't tell you, I lived my whole life in the backwoods and I've never had to really, well, honestly, I've never had to deal with light pollution at all. I have no practical experience in dealing with light pollution. But I can tell you under dark skies, short subs are the way to go because you get great noise management by way of stacking and dithering. And on nights when breezes might shake around the telescope a little bit, or a satellite or an aircraft might track across a sub, I don't lose a long sub, I just lose a 60 second sub. I mean, heck, a couple weeks ago, I even had an owl land on the telescope during the night and lost several subs, but I just lost several minutes worth of subs due to that. I didn't lose immensely long subs. And when you shoot short subs, you don't really have to worry all that much about the tracking of your mount. As long as it's decent, that's good enough. Now, my mount does track well on nights of really good seeing, I've gotten tracking down to 0.5 total error, but it's not something I really have to worry about. So as you can see, there are a lot of advantages to shooting shorter subs. The big disadvantages for short subs might be light pollution effects on short subs, and it also takes a considerable amount of time to stack a lot of short subs. In fact, the last time I stacked the subs when I had 1460 60 second subs, it took about seven hours for the computer to complete the job doesn't really matter to me though. I'm not in a rush and I have several computers. I just let the video processing computer crunch the numbers and did other stuff with the other devices. But when it comes to astrophotography, even in stacking and developing, it's necessary to play the game of patience. I've always thought it strange the way some astrophotographers will spend all night or multiple nights imaging data and then put a tremendous focus on how quickly they can stack it and then develop it. To be honest, after I've stacked the data, which is a process that can take many hours, even a couple days, I may well spend four to eight hours developing a single image. Quality comes with effort, and effort takes time. And I hope you can see from the images that I'm getting why I always advocate for a patient approach. Some DSOs, such as star clusters in certain galaxies, can be shot fairly quickly. But, by and large, astrophotography is a game for the patient. If you're going for the really dim and really challenging DSOs, be prepared to spend days, potentially even weeks on a target, and be prepared to spend many, many hours stacking and developing that data. Overall, you'll get fewer images, but the images that you get will be the ones that you and others look at and think, now those are truly extraordinary. Thank you for watching. As always, if you have any questions or thoughts, please leave them in the comments section below. And if you like what you see on the Sky Story channel, please take a moment to like and subscribe. It really helps. Now, have fun doing astrophotography and get out there and shoot that sky.